Welcome to the Deep Dive, where I uploaded my transcript for the podcast and have two AI hosts talk about it. They may go into more depth than I went into. So without further ado, here's the Deep Dive. Welcome back, everyone. Today, we're going to be diving into something, well, let's just say it can feel like a real roller coaster. Oh, tell me about it. Idealization and devaluation in relationships. You know that feeling. Someone puts you on pedestal and then... Bam, you're right back down in the dirt. Yeah, exactly. And we've got some seriously thought-provoking material to unpack today. I think a lot of people are going to relate to this one, especially after all the emails we've gotten. Absolutely. It's more common than we might realize. Okay, so to set the scene, we're looking at an audio excerpt that breaks down this whole idealization and devaluation cycle. It really zeroes in on how this pattern shows up with certain personality disorders. Which we will definitely get into. But honestly, I think the core ideas here are relevant to any clutch relationship, really. Have you ever felt like you're walking on eggshells, never knowing if you're going to get praised or criticized? Like you can never quite measure up, right? Exactly. And... You know what? The audio uses this really cool analogy. It's like walking a tightrope. Oh, I like that. It really captures that feeling of instability, you know? And that anxiety. Yes. The anxiety, like, is this going to hold or am I going to fall? And what's fascinating is a lot of times this whole tightrope walk is coming from some deep-seated stuff within the person who's doing the idealizing and devaluing. So it's not just that they're, like moody or something. Right. It goes way deeper than that. We're talking about struggles with self-worth, maybe a fear of abandonment, even difficulty regulating emotions, that kind of thing. Wow. Okay. So the source material specifically links this cycle to a group of personality disorders called Cluster B. Now, we're not in the business of diagnosing anyone here. It's helpful to have that context, though, right? Totally. It gives us some insight into why this pattern might be happening. For sure. Now, the audio uses some abbreviations for these disorders, like ID, ESFD. IED, DASD. I'll admit, I needed a little cheat sheet for these. Well, let's break them down then. So ID, that stands for Impulsive Disregard Disorder. Basically, a disregard for social norms, the rights of others, that sort of thing. Right. Right. And the audio actually gives this really striking example of how idealization and devaluation might play out with ID. Okay, so picture this. Someone incredibly charming, charismatic, they use those qualities to their advantage. They might idealize people they see as high status. Oh, I've seen this. It's like they see those people as stepping stones. You got it. Like a a way to get what they want. But once those connections have served their purpose, poof, devalued, discarded, almost like they were just transactions. Yeah. That's kind of chilling when you think about it. It can be. Now, next up, we've got ESFD, which is extreme self-focused disorder. Okay, and from what I got from the audio, the idealization here is all about ego, isn't it? 100%. Classic example. Imagine a boss who loves to publicly praise an employee, shower them with accolades, treat them like a star. But there's a catch. Big time. It's all contingent on that employee feeding their ego, making them look good. Oh, man, I've had a boss like that. It's all sunshine and roses until you disagree with them, even a little. Exactly. And then, boom, you're public enemy number one. The idealization vanishes the second you stop propping up their fragile sense of self. It's crazy how quickly they can turn on you. Because it all comes back to protecting their ego. Anyone who threatens that is instantly devalued. Out of the picture. Done. Okay, so we've had this smooth operator with ID, the ego-driven boss with ESFD. What's next? Next up is IED. Emotional Intensity Disorder. And this one, this is where the emotional swings can get really wild. Oh, yeah. Think about it. You're in a relationship. Everything seems blissful. Your partner is showering you with love and affection. You're on cloud nine. But then... Something small happens. The tiniest thing. You're running late. You forget to call. And suddenly you're facing this tidal wave of rage. It's like they go from zero to 60 in a split second. Exactly. And that intense emotional shift, it's often rooted in this deep fear of abandonment. So even little things can trigger those feelings of insecurity and then bam evaluation city right it's like the idealization is there but it's so fragile so easily shattered okay last but not least we have DISD dramatic attention seeking disorder ah yes This one's interesting. The audio paints a really vivid picture of how idealization might look with this. Okay, lay it on me. All right, imagine you've got a friend who is incredibly supportive when you're going through a tough time. They're constantly checking in, showering you with compliments, making you feel like a million bucks. Like, finally, 
Someone gets me. Right. It feels amazing. But here's the catch. As soon as you start feeling better, or if someone else comes along who they see as more exciting, more interesting... The attention just disappears. Vanishes. Like you never existed. And they might even start gossiping about you, putting you down. Wait, what? Why? Because it's all about getting that attention back on them. Remember, drama equals validation for them. It's like their ability to idealize is completely dependent on being in the spotlight. You got it. And when that need isn't met, they resort to devaluation to try and regain control. It's almost like they need that drama to feel alive or something. In a way, yeah. It's a way of regulating their emotions, even if it's incredibly damaging to everyone else involved. So we've gone through these really specific examples, but what really stands out to me is the impact this whole thing has on the person on the receiving end of all this. Oh, absolutely. It can be incredibly disorienting and emotionally draining to be caught in that cycle. The audio uses the term emotional whiplash. Perfect description. One minute you're adored, the next you're being criticized, often for things that seem completely out of your control. And it can really mess with your head, you know? (laughs) You start questioning your own reality. Am I actually as wonderful as they said I was? Or Uh as terrible as they're making me out to be? Right. Because you start to internalize those extreme swings in perception. And your self-esteem takes a hit. For sure. You might find yourself walking on eggshells all the time, trying to please them, avoid triggering those devaluing episodes. So it becomes this exhausting game where you're always trying to meet these impossible standards. And always feeling like you're falling short. But it's important to remember, it's not about you being not enough. Right, right? exactly. It's about their internal struggles and their inability to maintain a stable, realistic view of others. Okay, so if you find yourself in this kind of dynamic, where do you even begin? How do you get off that tightrope? Well, the first step is just recognizing the pattern. Right. Knowledge is power. And once you understand what's happening... You're less likely to get swept up in it. Exactly. You can start to see those red flags and create some distance. Now, the audio offers some really practical advice on this. Like setting boundaries. Yeah. Being clear about what you will and won't tolerate. Yes. And it really emphasizes that you are not responsible for the other person's emotional state. You can't fix them. You can't. And trying to will just drain you. Their work is their own. Right. So it's about taking back your own power, prioritizing your well-being. Which is so important. You know, there's this one thing from the source material that I found really interesting. It mentions that even for the person doing the idealizing and devaluing. Even for them. Yeah. It's ultimately an exhausting experience for them, too. Wow. I never thought of it that way. It suggests that they are also experiencing a level of suffering. They're trapped in this cycle of black and white thinking. Unable to see the nuances of human relationships. So it's not just about labeling them as toxic or whatever. Right. There's a deeper level of complexity there. It makes you wonder if if it's causing them pain too, does that mean change is possible? That's a great question. I mean, if they're exhausted by it, maybe that exhaustion could be the catalyst for wanting something different, something more stable, more fulfilling. Okay, so we've talked about what this cycle is, the different ways it shows up, how it impacts everyone involved. But the source material leaves us with one final thought-provoking question. Oh, what is it? It asks, if the person engaging in this cycle is also finding it exhausting, what does that tell us about their internal experience? What's going on beneath the surface? Exactly. What's driving this need to idealize and then devalue? It makes you think... I mean, could it point to a deep longing for connection, for validation? But they're going about it in a way that sabotages those very things. Right. It's like they're seeking connection, but pushing it away at the same time. And that push and pull, that internal conflict, it has to be exhausting. It really challenges us to look beyond those surface judgments and try to understand the deeper human story that's unfolding. Because that understanding can be incredibly freeing, not only for the person caught in the cycle, but also for those around them. Okay, so as we wrap up this part of our deep dive, I'm curious, what are some key takeaways that you think our listeners should really hold on to? Hmm, let me think. Well, first and foremost, recognizing the pattern. It's crucial. Once you understand the mechanics of idealization and devaluation, you can start to see it play out in your own relationships. And that awareness is powerful. It allows you to step back, you know, and make more conscious choices about how you engage. And, you know, another big one, you're not responsible for fixing someone else's issues. Oh, that's huge. You can offer support and encouragement, of course, but ultimately their journey of healing is their own. Exactly. Setting healthy boundaries is also key. It's about knowing what you're willing to tolerate and being clear about your limits. 
And sometimes the healthiest boundary might be creating some distance from the relationship. Yeah, sometimes that's necessary. If you're feeling that emotional whiplash, that constant push and pull of being idealized and then devalued, trust your gut. It's telling you something's not right. It really is. And remember, it's not about you being not enough. It's about the other person's internal struggles and their inability to maintain a healthy, balanced view of you. Right. We can get so caught up in the blame game. Totally. But this deep dive really highlights just how complex these dynamics are. There's often pain and unmet needs on both sides of the equation. Absolutely. And I think that recognition can be a starting point for compassion, both for yourself and for the other person. Not to excuse harmful behavior, but to understand that there's often a deeper story unfolding beneath the surface. And maybe... Just maybe that understanding can open up the possibility for change and healing, even if it's a long road. It's a journey, but it's possible. So as you move forward, what steps can you take to cultivate healthier, more balanced connections? What boundaries do you need to set? What needs of your own might be going unmet? Those are such great questions. And I think it starts with awareness, paying attention to how you feel in your relationships. What patterns are you noticing? Exactly. And remember, you have the power to choose the kind of relationships you want to be in. And the more you understand these complex dynamics, the better equipped you'll be to create relationships that are truly fulfilling and supportive. Couldn't agree more. This deep dive has been incredibly insightful. Thank you for sharing this material with us. And I hope it's given you some valuable food for thought. And remember, the journey of understanding ourselves and our relationships is ongoing. Stay curious, stay compassionate, and keep exploring. It's like they're seeking connection, but pushing it away at the same time. And that push and pull, that internal conflict, it has to be exhausting. It really challenges us to look beyond those surface judgments and try to understand the deeper human story that's unfolding. Because that understanding can be incredibly freeing, not only for the person caught in the cycle, but also for those around them. Okay, so as we wrap up this part of our deep dive, I'm curious, what are some key takeaways that you think our listeners should really hold on to? Hmm, let me think. Well, first and foremost, recognizing the pattern. It's crucial. Once you understand the mechanics of idealization and devaluation, you can start to see it play out in your own relationships. Hmm. And that awareness is powerful. It allows you to step back, you know, and make more conscious choices about how you engage. And, you know, another big one. You're not responsible for fixing someone else's issues. Oh, that's huge. You can offer support and encouragement, of course, but ultimately their journey of healing is their own. Exactly. Setting healthy boundaries is also key. It's about knowing what you're willing to tolerate and being clear about your limits. And sometimes the healthiest boundary might be creating some distance from the relationship. Yeah, sometimes that's necessary. If you're feeling that emotional whiplash, that constant push and pull of being idealized and then devalued, trust your gut. It's telling you something's not right. It really is. Mm -hmm. And remember, it's not about you being not enough. It's about the other person's internal struggles and their inability to maintain a healthy, balanced view of you. Right. We can get so caught up in the blame game. Totally. Mm. But this deep dive really highlights just how complex these dynamics are. There's often pain and unmet needs on both sides of the equation. Absolutely. And I think that recognition can be a starting point for compassion both for yourself and for the other person. Not to excuse harmful behavior, but to understand that there's often a deeper story unfolding beneath the surface. And maybe, just maybe, that understanding can open up the possibility for change and healing, even if it's a long road. It's a journey, but it's possible. So as you move forward, what steps can you take to cultivate healthier, more balanced connections? What boundaries do you need to set? What needs of your own might be going unmet? Those are such great questions. And I think it starts with awareness paying attention to how you feel in your relationships. What patterns are you noticing? Exactly. And remember, you have the power to choose the kind of relationships you want to be in. And though we understand these complex dynamics, the better equipped you'll be to create relationships that are truly fulfilling and supportive. Couldn't agree more. This deep dive has been incredibly insightful. Yeah. Thank you for sharing this material with us, and I hope it's giving you some valuable food for thought. And remember, the journey of understanding ourselves and our relationships is ongoing. Stay curious, stay compassionate, and keep exploring. It's like they're seeking connection, but pushing it away at the same time. And that push and pull, that internal conflict, it has to be exhausting. It really challenges us to look beyond those surface judgments and try to understand the deeper human story that's unfolding. Because that understanding can be incredibly freeing, not only for the person caught in the cycle, but also for those around them. 
Okay, so as we wrap up this deep dive, I'm curious, what are some key takeaways that you think our listeners should really hold on to? Hmm, let me think. Well, first and foremost, recognizing the pattern. It's crucial. Once you understand the mechanics of idealization and devaluation, you can start to see it play out in your own relationships. And that awareness is powerful. It allows you to step back, you know, and make more conscious choices about how you engage. And, you know, another big one. Mm -hmm. You're not responsible for fixing someone else's issues. Oh, that's huge. You can offer support and encouragement, of course, but ultimately their journey of healing is their own. Exactly. Setting healthy boundaries is also key. It's about knowing what you're willing to tolerate and being clear about your limits. And sometimes the healthiest boundary might be creating some distance from the relationship. Yeah, sometimes that's necessary. If you're feeling that emotional whiplash, that constant push and pull of being idealized and then devalued, trust your gut. It's telling you something's not right. It really is. Yeah. And remember, it's not about you being not enough. It's about the other person's internal struggles and their inability to maintain a healthy, balanced view of you. Right. We can get so caught up in the blame game. Totally. But this deep dive really highlights just how complex these dynamics are. There's often pain and unmet needs on both sides of the equation. Absolutely. And I think that recognition can be a starting point for compassion, both for yourself and for the other person. Not to excuse harmful behavior, but to understand that there's often a deeper story unfolding beneath the surface. And maybe, just maybe, that understanding can open up the possibility for change and healing, even if it's a long road. It's a journey, but it's possible. So as you move forward, what steps can you take to cultivate healthier, more balanced connections? What boundaries do you need to set? What needs of your own might be going unmet? Those are such great questions. And I think it starts with awareness. Paying attention to how you feel in your relationships. What patterns are you noticing? Exactly. And remember, you have the power to choose the kind of relationships you want to be in. And the more you understand these complex dynamics, the better equipped you'll be to create relationships that are truly fulfilling and supportive. Couldn't agree more. This deep dive has been incredibly insightful. Thank you for sharing this material with us, and I hope it's given everyone listening some valuable food for thought. And remember, the journey of understanding ourselves and our relationships is ongoing. Stay curious, stay compassionate, and keep exploring. Until next time.